Pan Pan Psychast. Part two: Further analysis and discussion. I was just sat in my hot tub, and now I'm here. I don't know what's been going. On. I've missed the whole discussion thus far. Help me, Doctor Miller, find the way back onto the straight and narrow. So, Liv, so far you've told us that. Well, look, we go in the we go back to the past. We try to kill our grandfather, and you know, as David Lewis says, so there's going to be some sort of commonplace incident or what we might see as some weird cosmic fluke right Mm -hmm. that says oh uh when i pull the trigger or let go of the bow grandfather doesn't die right Mm. yeah now people go right that's good because if he did die then it'd lead to impossible things like my granddad dying both on you know the 19th of september 2001 or dying on the 21st of September 1945, yeah, right? Exactly. Which you can't have them. Or me both existing and me not existing. And David Lewis says, ah, well, okay, that's fine. But we can still say that I can kill my grandfather. And people say to Lewis, oh, Lewis, you've just traded in one incoherent thing for another incoherent thing. Hmm. My granddad dying on one day and not dying on that day uh, for this, I can do something and cannot do something and you say Liv building on Lewis's idea oh no 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 but when I say I can do something it can be different relative to different sets of facts yeah exactly so sometimes I go I can sp- can Greg speak French no he can't <laughs> can Greg speak French <laughs> yes he can yeah I've never had a French lesson so I can't but I have a larynx yeah and exactly. powerful diaphragm <laughs> to crush the wind inside my body <laughs> exert it out my mouth I could speak French in that sense, right? Mm, yeah, could. exactly. Okay. Different facts. So now Liv says, in a kind of really clever, ingenious way. Oh, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, that, <laughs> well, look, what we do is we say, I have the ability to kill my grandfather. It'll yeah. never happen, but I'm still able to do it. This is the idea. Yeah. And people who say, oh, no, you can't. Well, what they've been doing is they've been focusing on output focused theories of abilities. Now you say, ah, no, but this isn't what we mean when we're looking at abilities. What we mean is input focused. So we need to look at things like whether I'm a good shot, whether I have been training for a long time, whether the gun's not jammed. And you say, when we say, when we adopt an input focused theory of abilities, then we can say like, I am able to shoot my granddad. I am able to square a circle. I am able to do lots of logically impossible things because of what we mean by abilities. Yeah, exactly. You have, you know, square in a circle, you have a pen, you have a piece of paper, this kind of thing. You know, you won't, but that doesn't entail that you can't. Not to criticise it too hard, but we're going to really hook onto this idea of these abilities. So like in your paper, just to quote you, say like abilities should not be judged on the success of their actions. So use the example earlier of like learning to play the piano. Um, or maybe we could say like uh, use another analogy of like a driving test, right? So we could say like uh, um, I can drive even though I haven't passed my driving test because I learned to drive when I did my theory. I learned to drive during my driving lessons, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And that these input conditions obviously play a really big impact as well. But the kind of the, the thought that kind of comes to mind is that, well, surely there may be some forms of abilities that necessitate the success of that action. Surely. Like what? Uh, let's go for it, guys. So let's say you're a lawyer and you're training to be a lawyer. If you... <laughs> is this an yeah. example? That was like a... Come up get him, boy. Let's go, guys. <laughs> I expect you to put all your hands in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, cheer. Power Rangers activate. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so like being a lawyer, right? So we could say that if you do not uh, complete your law degree and you don't become a lawyer and get certified by other people, you cannot practice law. You can know a lot about it. You can, uh, you know, read about it. You can teach other people about it, but you can't do it yourself. It's necessitated on you succeeding on the ability of studying law. Okay, but then I would say to that, the ability to be a lawyer can be broken down. I don't think that the ability to be, a, I, I think that is like a, uh, that is a an accumulation of many different abilities. Um, so you're saying that you can't, you don't have the ability to be a lawyer because you haven't 
pass a test, right? But I would say something like, okay, cool, that, that may be a failure, but you still have done certain things that will aid you in... I mean, under the legal system, you would be able to practice law, mm. but I don't think that that then entails that you can't be a lawyer just because you haven't passed a test. Like, for example, you know, you know your st- stuff, not <laughs> you, <evil> stuff. <laughs> you can wear a suit, you yeah, can wear a suit. Look real good in a tie. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You've got a briefcase. Don't, don't worry, you can be a lawyer. <laughs> it's fine. That's, That's all this is. Yeah. But um, we've, got, we've got other examples that aren't just necessarily law based, though, right? Or like passing a test just based. Law based. Just law based. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I only want lawyer examples. examples here. That's it. What was your What was your example? But what Greg? if you can't? If you don't pass the test for, if you don't pass the bar, you don't have the ability to practice law. So is that Ollie's point? Is oh look, this I have to succeed in passing the test to have the ability. Does that make sense? Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 Ultimately, we could still assess this via input conditions. Mm -hmm. I think this doesn't nullify input conditions, right? Um, I just think that technically, if we're we're just talking about like passing tests and stuff, but I don't think that, that, you know, passing a test is going to nullify your ability to be a lawyer Mm. Um, because you've done, you know, say for example, you've what did lawyers do? They like learn <laughs> they go, stuff. So, 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 so you could say, like, so you could say, like, there's a qualified lawyer who's been teaching law for twenty years, very successful. Uh, they accidentally crash into someone, and they don't have insurance, and they get their law qualifications torn up. This example is really bad. <laughs> okay. they, they can still practice law. They're still a, they've had experience of law of teaching it, but they are they can't currently practice it. But yeah. they have been able to practice it, and they've proven through their years of experience that they're very good at. It. Yeah, so it's kind of like um, that example is like uh, a pianist who, say, for example, has had their hands chopped off. Mm. So this was this was always like, <laughs> yeah, it's a very gruesome uh, podcast. This one, um, <laughs> yeah. lots of lots of murder, bodily and death. harm. Death. Um, so yeah, so say a pianist who's been practicing. P- I was going to say law. <laughs> <laughs> piano mm-hmm. <laughs> they've got law on the mind uh, practicing piano for however many years mm. um, then gets their hands chopped off and for some reason they can't then learn to play piano mm. with their feet one of my supervisor I put this example in one of my papers and he was like but uh, you know they could learn to play piano with their head or their feet and I was like okay well, <laughs> let's say they don't do that um, <laughs> they're uh, not mad just, completely <laughs> swerve <laughs> they don't you get lots of painters who Paint yeah, with their, with their, paint with their with mouth, yeah. paint with their feet. Yeah. So let's say that they can't do that for some reason. Their, mm. their mouth doesn't open wide enough to put the paintbrush in or um, something like that. Uh, well, you can say that they have the ability, but, you know, they don't lose that ability. This is what I want to say. You don't... You, I, I feel like you gain abilities, gain ability and lose ability slowly. Um, so you don't automatically lose an ability just Mm. because a pianist won't automatically lose their ability to play the piano just because suddenly they've got their hands chopped off right um well maybe gradually after a while if they don't play for a while we there's this big distinction in the ability literature between specific and general abilities Uh Mm. um general abilities are those that you you know like this pianist in the example they Mm -hmm. have the general ability to play the piano but they don't have the specific ability i.e they don't have the ability to play the piano at that moment in time. Right. So um, another perhaps more explicit example of this is say a pianist has been locked up mm-hmm. and you say to the pianist, do you have the ability to play the piano right now? They're locked up without a piano. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, these examples really are so prison. crazy. <laughs> they're in a really fancy prison. <laughs> I'm in prison. <laughs> <laughs> you can't take that in. <laughs> You got one phone call. What do you want? Why can't I? I I need a metaphysical example for something later on. So yeah, this 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 pianist is in in prison without his piano. Unfortunately, he tried to get it in, Um, and you ask him. The guard comes up to him and he's like, "Can you play the piano?" And the pianist is like, "No." Um, That'd be really unusual. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, Yeah. Okay, brilliant. So yeah, that's a great example. And so like like the locked up pianist or the. The lawyer who broke the law so no one can practice law. Hmm. Let's move away from people and abilities. I was thinking something like uh, take a. Uh, this this is getting quite out there. And if we have another possible world in which you know I, I can, I have all the ingredients I need to make bread. Which are what are the ingredients I need to make bread? Bread. Bread. Yeah, just bread. <laughs> bread Flour. stuff. I've got bread stuff. Flour, water, <laughs> yeast. yeast. Flour, water, yeast. That's salt. all I need. Bit of salt. Uh, do you want to put some? Like Nuts, olives in it? 
nuts, nuts. berries, that kind nuts. of stuff. A real wholesome nuts loaf. And bread. Yeah. yeah. And now, uh, this is definitely an alternate universe. <laughs> and I put them all together in my big mixing bowl and leave them there. But this is an alternative possible world which, where heat doesn't exist. So would we say then that the bread has the, that the yeast, the water and the flour, the berries and the nuts have the ability <laughs> to turn into a wholesome loaf without heat? Yeah, I would probably say, yeah, I would say that they have the potential... So um, if you walked up to the bread and uh, the, this pile awesome. of things and said, "Can you become bread?" You think it would be okay for it to say? Yeah, they'd say. Yeah, I can yeah, do we, that. We can become bread. We can become bread, but there's no heat, so you'll have to wait a bit, Jack. <laughs> That'd be a better, uh, at least with the full thing there. Did you? You had a zoologist. We were talking about Ooh. the zoologist before we arrived. So yeah. So your example there is, um, let's, like, let's take your example bread, is water. It, imagine water in the possible world, but below zero degrees or zero degrees doesn't can't occur there. Never can happen in this world. So can water become frozen? It is the, water have the ability to freeze? And Liv says, off. yes, it does. And the water answers, I can freeze. I just can't do it at the moment. Yeah, so they don't have the specific ability to freeze, but they have the general ability to freeze, um, which is, I think is an interesting distinction. Um, and one which is, I think, especially prolific in the mm. piano example. Locked up pian- pianist without his piano. So maybe that you could explain it in a, the general and specific uh, distinction and how it helps in a bit more detail. Because in reference to this example, so we were thinking, what if there's an apocalypse and all the animals die and everything's turned to dust? And I'm a zoologist. I don't have the ability <laughs> to practice zoology anymore. Um, and that might be like a general ability yeah, so- that I no longer have because there's no animals. I can't start yeah. going. These ones are. Whatever type of animal they are, these ones are. <laughs> <laughs> no, whatever. You. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't play the piano. Either. Well, I don't think you have the ability in the first place. <laughs> By the sounds of it, yeah. <laughs> are you some kind of insect? No? I don't know what the difference is. <laughs> but does that make sense? Well, I, think, that, I, I think yeah. it would be exactly the same as the piano example the mm-hmm. bread example i i still think you have the general ability to be a zoologist you've just lo- like um i think to put it in terms you've you've lost the opportunity to yeah. practice zoology <laughs> um so you've lost your specific ability because there aren't any animals to but you can still think about zoology you can still write stuff about zoology you can still talk about zoology mm. just because you're not actively practicing like the you know i guess the ability to practice to you know be a zoologist is is not just about practicing that that may be one input condition practicing zoology but Mm. other input conditions referring to my terrible jargon um would be like you know doing your own research like thinking thinking about things i guess to put it in like broad terms so you've got the general ability to do zoology but not the specific ability to to like hang out with animals yeah so again um back to kind of time travel examples you know you could say that the time traveler has the general ability to Mm. kill their grandfather although i think it's slightly different because they're not having anything taken away from them Mm -hmm. so in all of these examples that we've stated these examples someone's had something taken away from them which prohibits their practicing or their exercise of a certain mm-hmm. ability so you know in the piano example they've had their piano taken away <laughs> so these examples are so weird um and in the zoology example all the animals have gone <laughs> <laughs> and in the example with uh, the the flower and the water and <laughs> no the, heat no heat um whereas in the time travel case we don't have that um so i mean I th- I actually think sorry scrap what I said earlier. Uh, I think that time travelers both have general and specific abilities to kill their grandfathers because they they can and they do exercise their ability. I think that just what's lacking is that output condition, mm. um, which is also lacking when you you know lack a specific ability. But mm-hmm. I do think they do have specific abilities. Although I've just thought of that, so maybe don't ask me about that. <laughs> So when we think about time travel, Liv, lots of things come to mind. H.G. Wells, DeLoreans, hot tubs, PIM particles, Terminators and safety not being guaranteed. Um, is there any film or television series that you think gets the metaphysics of time travel right? So you mentioned earlier that you believe in this kind of like eternal idea of time. Is there any pop culture reference which has that in a nutshell or uses that? Third Harry Potter film, hands down. Best time oh, travel. Prisoner of Azkaban. Yeah. What happens in that again? And- <laughs> 
Did you, uh, did I have seen it. It's a time. It's been a long ago. time. Um, so basically, Prisoner of Azkaban. Prisoner. It's the best one. It is yeah, the best it's the best one. one. Yeah. Uh, so basically, Harry and Hermione leaving Ron in the uh, hospital. Probably I was going to say hotel. It's not an hotel. <laughs> in the hospital, uh, they Hermione's got this time turner, uh, uh-huh. which means she can travel back in time. So Harry and Hermione go and try and save both Buckbeat the Hippogriff's life and mm-hmm. Sirius Black's life. Um, I'm a bit of a Harry Potter nerd. Uh, <laughs> and so they go back in time and we see them like crouching bef- behind Hagrid. Mm, I remember. The, the pumpkins, I think they're pumpkins. Yeah, they're yeah. pumpkins. Yeah. 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 And they see their earlier, like I like referring yes. to earlier and later than selves because mm. it makes them easier. Mm-hmm. So they see their earlier selves, i.e., um, you know, when they're in the Hagrid's hut. And in the first time round, so before we knew that they'd travel back in time, we noticed that there were these rocks that were thrown into Hagrid's yeah. hut, mm-hmm. and they don't really think anything of them, but it causes them to leave Hagrid's hut because the minister is coming. So then we get later Harry and Hermione travel back in time, and they're both like, mm. oh, why aren't we leaving Hagrid's hut? Like, the minister's coming. We need yeah. to do something. So Hermione, like, completely thinking on her feet, she just picks up a stone and throws it. Now, that's really interesting. That's a really nice example of a nice, consistent time travel because we have this situation in which Harry and Hermione, later than Harry and Hermione, don't mm. change the past. Okay. They just do what's already happened. Mm. Um, but it it doesn't seem that they're acting because they have to, right? Mm-hmm. So this is when like I find the free will stuff is quite interesting because a lot of people are like, well, if you can't change the past, then it seems like that, you know, you're everything's determined like Mm -hmm. harry and hermione were predetermined to throw the rock but they didn't realize that they had to hermione wasn't like okay so at exactly zero eight hundred hours we must throw this rock to Mm -hmm. cause us to leave uh hagrid's heart no she just like instinctively threw it so she didn't change the past we didn't have a a series we didn't have a situation in which we had harry and hermione and ron earlier than not leaving and Harry, Ron, and Hermione earlier than leaving at the same time, so there wasn't this contradiction. You have this nice one universe slick example of how time travel should work. Well, there's a very concise summary of that movie, and it is the best Harry Potter movie, so you should watch it, Jack. Um, any <laughs> movies that get it really bad, like really just oh, well. this is just made up. This has no idea of what time is actually like. Okay, do you need like do do we have all day? Because I can probably list. Uh, a, a give us, give us, your, give us like your top two. Back to the Future, all three of them, they suck. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, Hot take. Sorry if you were born in the eighties. Um, why? Why does Back to the Future? Because get they so changed wrong? the past. You know all the bloody things when the the pictures are like disappearing, and I'm just like that. No, no. Also, you don't have sex with your mum. Like, stop. Yeah. That's also, weird. Sorry. also, my <laughs> McFly did invent rock and roll as well. So that's you know. <laughs> Something worth saying. But what if Greg does want to go back in time and have sex with his mum? Why is that so wrong? <laughs> so this is... You all laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but this is one example, right? I can't go... So there's in, in the philosophy of time travel, there's the information loops, aren't there? Yeah. Mm. So yeah. that's when me in the future... Oh, I've come across on the floor... A manuscript. I open the manuscript, and there in the manuscript are the uh, blueprint and instructions of how to build a time machine. So right. I build it, yeah. and I think, okay, how did I get this? Where did it come from? Well, the only way I can guarantee this is safe is if I go back in time to pass on this information back to my former self. So I have this loop right in time where uh, something in the past depends on something in the future, but that depends in the future, right? So where did the manuscript initially come from yeah, is the exactly. question. But then you can apply this to cases similar to the grandfather paradox, but not where you're trying to get rid of people, right. but where you're trying to make people. <laughs> so I go back in the past, right? Yeah. To pass on my genetic code, to maybe to your mom. my mother, right? <laughs> you're like yeah. Oedipus. Yeah, say I'm Oedipus, right? Time and I, I want to make sure that I do... <laughs> The most ridiculous it. thing I've heard. But that does that make sense? So yeah. I go, I go back in the past, uh-huh. pass on my genetic code to my mother, you know, and then you're the father of yourself. And then I give birth. My mother gives birth to me, to and then I go back in the past. Right? Is that? Yeah. That okay. Work? So interesting. Um. So yeah, there's a whole rich, like, lot of cool stuff on like information loops, and I don't know if you've seen a film called Predestination no. or watched 
or oh, not watched or read um, uh, like short story called All You Zombies. It's about uh, a self-parenting time traveler. Um, and it's pretty whack and con- but like, mm-hmm. you know, ultimately quite nice and consistent. I can't say I know exactly how it works because there's a lot of like loops and coming back and stuff. But it's about someone who um, essentially like is both the mother and father of their themselves mm. or something like that. And it's like crazy. It's, it's a short story. Definitely, definitely read it. And Predestination um is the film with, based on the on the short story, but yeah, you got you've got these kind of weird, spooky loops if you have time travel, but like you know, Wait, you, hang on, hang on. Did you just say that someone is both their mother and their father? Yeah, so they like, yeah, it's 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 crazy. I can't. <laughs> You're really, gonna have to explain that in some way. I don't think I can because oh. um, I'll just get it wrong and I won't do justice to the um, like how detailed and precise this. Mm. Uh, this short story is. I think it's Robert Heinlein, Heinlein, Robert, something like that. Um, and yeah, he's yeah, it's crazy. You mentioned really early on in the interview that you like looking at uh, time travel into the past, but you don't like time travel in the future because you know the future. That means the future is deterministic, and this uh, goes against our intuition. Maybe that we're free, and putting words in your mouth here, or, or yeah, we like the uh, open future idea. So let's just focus on the past. It makes the discussion of free will and the discussion of time travel a lot easier for all of us. Let's yeah. not bite yeah. off too much. Uh, with that said, um, I want to ask you about time travel into the future. Wow. Um, <laughs> Why did you do this to me? <laughs> Let's say in the year 1000, I'm in my hot it's tub. Not the future. And then just you <laughs> just wait until we get there. We're going to go, we're going through time from the start. Year 1000. There's, 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 lo- the there's loads of problems with this. <laughs> okay. that, is the, that is the most palatable thing I'm about to say. <laughs> in the year 1000, You're I'm in a hot thing. tub <laughs> okay. and Greg comes over to me and goes, Hey, Jack, fancy bubbling that up a gear? And he programs it in. I go, No, what? And I disappear. And I'm in the year 3000. Yeah. Now, here's the kicker. In the year 2000. Are you sing the- yeah. God, <laughs> God decreed that it's impossible, or God decreed that no one can utter anything about asparagus, Paul Rudd, or bread. I love bread, and I want to go up to somebody in the year three thousand and say, "I love bread. You should check it out." Is this gonna, <laughs> I love bread. Is this going to be possible? Can I travel oh from the year one thousand to year three thousand and tell someone I love bread? If God has decreed in the year 2000 that no one can utter. So I think it would be similar to the grandfather paradox, mm. right? I think you'd have a situation in which if but, it was... But better and more interesting than David Lewis's original example, maybe. Okay. Because it involves bread. And Paul Rudd. And, <laughs> and asparagus. <laughs> the th- holy trinity of uh, awesome. any life, to yeah. be honest. Um yeah, but I think I I think I assume it would be similar to the uh, grandfather paradox example, mm. where I mean, is it logically impossible for you to utter? Do, can God uh, do that? I, I go like <laughs> every time I try and say it, God intervenes and says, "No, I decreed." Did you forget? Yeah, exactly. So I think it would be something like some commonplace coincidence. So yeah, there's this sense of my own paradox. Yeah. There, I yeah. <laughs> is that, do you want to build on that? Maybe Not maybe really. improve it. <laughs> How could you improve it, Jack? <laughs> no, just, just not do it at all. <laughs> really. There's, um, there's a lot of the coincidence stuff. So this is w- one part of the philosophy of time travel. Is the stuff that I do. It's a very small part. So time mm. travel and free will. But there's loads of other stuff. So this idea about commonplace coincidences. Mm-hmm. So you know, to stop you from doing the logically impossible, i.e., killing your grandfather or talking about bread. Uh, you, you would some commonplace coincidence would stop you, and a lot of people are like, "Sure, okay, that's fine. Coincidences happen; they're mm-hmm. not logically impossible. It's not logically impossible for Jack to slip on a banana peel before he utters bread <laughs> and knock him out." Um, I want some bread? Yeah. <laughs> and but uh, a lot of people are like, "Okay, cool." But if if say for example we have um. Who should I who should I use? I haven't used Ollie yet. Um if we have Ollie who is trying to do let's do auto infanticide. So he's trying to kill his younger self. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hate past Ollie. Yeah. That guy needs so, to So yeah, die. you're trying to kill your younger self. Um 
but he his he so he stands in front of him his younger self his baby self and his baby self is there and he puts the pulls the gun out and he shoots him what happens okay so for lewis the gun will jam or the bullet misses but then he tries again and again and again and again and again and again and he's like why won't this work and he's throw out the window just get rid of it so we we have this like long we have potentially long strings Mm. of highly improbable coincidences Mm. the gun continually jamming so a lot of people are like okay fine i'll accept that time travel is logically possible cool but it's at most highly improbable because of these long strings of highly improbable coincidences Mm. that will happen if you have someone like holly ollie who just won't give up he's just like ah god i'm not this there's something wrong with this gun he gets a new gun in uh he i don't know flamethrower I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I came with a whole arsenal with yeah. my time machine. Um, the it's like the back cave in there. Yeah, so a lot of people are like, okay, fine, time travel is logically possible, but I mean, it's at most highly improbable because of these like coincidences and long strings of highly improbable coincidences. Like that, you know, coincidences happen, but you don't get long strings of them. Mm. You don't get, you know, guns jamming every time you shoot, which mm. will have to be the case in time travel situations. Let us pause briefly to hear a short message from this week's sponsor, The Partially Examined Life. Allow me to break for a minute into your fabulous pen psychast experience. This is American lover of wisdom, Mark Lintonmeyer, telling you about the Partially Examined Life podcast network. You may have heard of the Partially Examined Life, given that I've been a guest on this podcast and Gregory Miller has been a guest on our podcast. The Partially Examined Life presents deep dives into philosophical texts, both classic and current, so if you want to delve deeper into any of the things you hear about on Pan PanPsyCast, we probably have an episode on it, since we've been going for 11 years with 34 million downloads to date. But that's not all you'll find at PartiallyExaminedLife.com. Our network includes five podcasts, including five fic treating philosophical fiction, combat, and classics treating more classics, and also two others that I personally host. There's Nakedly Examined Music, where we delve deeply into thoughtfully written music, into the mechanics, into the creative choices involved. This is a great way to learn about music that you may be unfamiliar with, as well as deepen your understanding of some music that you probably already love. Finally, our newest edition, Pretty Much Pop, a culture podcast, applies some of the lessons we learned from Partially Examined Life to take on popular TV and movie franchises, media consumption habits, pastimes like escape rooms and Lego, minority media representation, and we interview actors, comedians, entertainment journalists, people involved in costuming and other aspects of film and TV production, and much, much more. You can find out about all of these podcasts at partiallyexaminedlife.com. So thanks to the Pan Psychast gents, and thanks to you Pan Psychast listeners. Go Pan Psychast yourselves! To find out more about The Partially Examined Life, hit the link in the iTunes description. Okay, let's jump back into the discussion. Should we have the listener questions jingle? You can decide, Dr. Miller. Insert the listener questions jingle here. Hello? We're sorry, the number you have dialed is not in service at this time. Hello? Is there somebody there? Listener questions with Jack and Andy and Ollie. Listener questions with Jack and Andy and Ollie. Listener questions with Jack and Andy and Ollie. But Greg might be there. But Greg might be there as well. Hello? So if you didn't enjoy the listener question jingle, you can blame Dr. Miller. I think his personal email address can be found on his university webpage. Please don't direct any hate mail my way. Uh, we've got a bunch of listener questions that we're going to throw to Liv. Liv, we've got to, we've got to, we'll see how many we can move through. So I don't hate to put the pressure on, but time constraints, time joke, insert here. Let's see how many we can get through. In, uh, in, yeah, sorry. <laughs> so this question is from uh, Peter Fink. From a very different world. That's a joke about possible worlds. It's funny. Uh, the United <laughs> States of America. <laughs> what credence do you give to the theory that humans, or whatever we may evolve into, are the cause of the Big Bang? He goes on. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that time travel is perhaps the most grave, irreversible, powerful action that their mere human regrets of suffering, although terrible, don't warrant the use of time travel because whatever good action we um, can imagine, e.g. kill Hitler, can have unintended consequences on the continuum. The Big Bang 
The creation of <laughs> conscious existence, perhaps, is the only truly necessary thing. As well, the Big Bang was the result of a massive energy occurrence. Is time travel only possible in the sense we could send energy back in time, but not matter? Although the two are interconnected, as we understand now. Is this our last act as much time and universe can come to an end? Perhaps this question is better suited for the upcoming guest, Katie Mack, but I would also really love to hear what Liv has to say on this topic. Um, so I, I assume that the, the, the thing, the question is about like whether we can go back in time and kill, not kill, <laughs> lots of killing going on, cause the Big Bang. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Yeah. Did we cause it? Yeah. Did we cause it? Probably not. Um, there we go. Nice. No. Yeah. Also, it's not physically possible, so we definitely didn't. So the next question is from Embrace the Void. Do we have good reason to hope we're not living in a universe where time travel is possible? Yeah, we do. Um, I think I said this in the first episode about relativity and stuff. I don't know, like I'm not a physicist, so I don't know the exact the exact science behind it. So please don't quote me on this. But um, I, I don't think it's, I mean... I mean, it might be possible. It's like obviously possible for you to get an infinite mass spinning at an infinitely fast speed. But I think we definitely have good hope to think that we're not living in a situation, a world, or like our our world isn't a world in which there's time travel. There's a follow up. So, if time travel is real, does that mean the entire history of the universe is necessarily locked into a void paradox? Or do timelines diverge into multiverse or some other option? <laughs> <laughs> So, so what's a void universe? Was it is that the phrase void universe? Uh, no, multi a void paradox. Void, so, a yeah. void, a void paradox. <laughs> yeah, not a void paradox. That's different. Sorry. I thought that was like a, a type of paradox. Uh, so this is the stuff that I do in terms of like determinism and stuff. Well, I mm. want to argue that we're free in terms of time travel. So I'm arguing like a com taking a compatibilist stance. So even though like, past facts and certain things are fixed, you can still make choices when you travel back in time. So Greg's choice to kill his grandfather, even though he will not kill his grandfather, it was a choice he potentially made mm. freely. I think obviously this depends on your views of free will. So um, I don't think time travel necessarily entails determinism at all. Um, I think it's just as... as as it's just a similar situation to what we have without time travel. Can I ask my listener question? So, <laughs> sorry. You were listening. I am, I am listening. Uh, so you say that you're kind of like keen on the idea of free will and other philosophers of time travel may disagree and argue that determinism. Which one's more popular? Which one has more, at the moment, more kind of uh, work behind Definitely it? Definitely the determinism stuff. Um, so time travel and free will is pretty new i i can i think there's probably i can count on my hands how many papers on time travel and free will there are partly because like most of the time that has been spent researching time travel has been given to whether it's logically possible or not mm -hmm. now that it's kind of widely agreed it's logically possible the debate has shifted so we're now looking at the implications of that logical possibility for other metaphysical issues Free will just being like a small strand of that. So a lot of people do work on causation, time travel under different theories of time. Um, but d I mean, more often than not, people are arguing for a scenario in which determinism is the case. Um, there's a paper by Michael Ray called Time Travels Are Not Free, very on the nose. <laughs> I mean, you can probably tell what he's arguing for. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> and a lot of people, it focuses on this idea of like, um, you know, you can't change the past mm -hmm. and causal histories and, you know, backwards causation and this all this kind of stuff. So, yeah, determinism seems to be popular and I'm hard arguing you're, against that. You're a renegade, Liv. I, I, think, I like to think of myself as a renegade, yeah. Nice. Let me try and do a couple of questions at the same time and kill two grandfathers with one rifle, so to speak. We've got, uh, you spoke earlier about how, uh, we've spoken a lot of controversial things. We've spoken about We've inferred <laughs> incest. We've spoken about the murder of our grandparents and loved ones. We've spoken about going against God and speaking about bread. And two of our questions link into the morality of time travel. One, A.G. Holdeer asks, uh, what would it mean for time travel to be possible but morally wrong? And our good friend Matthias Kenley, who's joined us on some of our Patreon discussions before, asks us, if time travel and changing the past to change the present or future was feasible, would we ever be justified in changing? It. Let's say we want to prevent something bad happening, 
but with that we also prevent some good gives an example of Tony Stark how do we how do we deal with this um so I guess a proviso here is you don't think you can go back and change the no. past but if you could change the past do you think was that going to be your answer there and I've, I've just, yeah. to, the proviso you can't you can change the past are we ever morally justified in doing so so I mean I'm going to preface this by saying you can't change the past uh so I'm avoiding the issue straight off the back um, but if you could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you can't, Ollie. Uh, no. Oh, I don't know. Can I give oh, you an example? Ethics. So, like, you, you go back to uh, biblical Bond, times. Bond offer assassinating Hitler. Surely that's the best example you can think of, right? Uh, no, I was thinking of, like, times. Oh, biblical oh, times. Oh, okay. Take it. Judas. Ju- yeah, that's oh. exactly. So, could you go back and stop Judas from snitching on the, on, on the big J and well, just kind of get him off the I hook? Just, oh, get him off oh the my cross? God. I can't even think, like, the implications I of that, that, of preventing that, would just be like. But, insane yeah like yeah. can you imagine we what would happen if well, cr- Jesus, Jesus yeah sorry we wouldn't be repentant we, he needed to die right so maybe he would just like trip maybe over you hate anyway. humans I didn't say what our motivation <laughs> maybe he would, would be. just like fall over <laughs> <laughs> just stop yeah. us <laughs> he died for our sin was he betrayed was yeah. he... no no he just sort of fell over um, yeah, but he's the saviour though maybe, maybe it wouldn't be as like you know he wouldn't be on the cross and he wouldn't do that whole like just thing. old yeah, he, he just Goose. died of old age yeah. and natural causes. Yeah. Okay. Um, but he'd still, everyone would still be like, oh, Jesus, he lived a long life. Yeah. <laughs> he taught us so much. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> 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 Sorry, that, that should not sound sarcastic. Um, yeah, so I don't know, basically. I, I, this is what I said before. Like, I try and avoid ethical and moral stuff because I ultimately don't know and I don't want to, I don't think I'm the authority to say what's morally right or wrong and I don't like... How I don't like it, basically. Well, you've killed multiple grandfathers with that shot because all the rest of them are kind of contingent yeah, right? on these kind of things. Everyone loves changing the past. Well, you'll it, makes, wa- it makes time travel a lot less sexy. You'll want to change the past, <laughs> and you wa- that, cool. Sorry, Greg. That, it, because if we're we can't change the past, but if we're eternalists, but is there any view on which we can change the past? Um, so there's been like attempts to to do a can, like a time travel scenario in which you can change the past um these focus on hyper time and multi-dimensional time uh-huh. um so you have two so you have n- like time and then hyper time i mean i'm definitely 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 not hyper well versed in great. this at all um my podcast co-host elliot did his um dissertation on hyper time models mm. so uh, sarah bernstein has she argues for hyper time models in which you can change the past Peter Vanningwagen has written a, a wonderful paper about changing the past. So there's a lot of research being done about changing the past and whether you can change the past. Not so like under eternalist model, but just with different dimensions of time. So you've got normal time and you've got hyper time and somehow magically you'll be able to change the past. But so is a hyper time view, there's a there's another yeah, time so that it's we like all little, exist in, or is it that it's just another level of time, I think. So I think it's like some some kind of Di- five dimensional stuff oh man once you go past four dimensions there's no point <laughs> I Talk- like to keep it as simple as possible <laughs> talking things minimum that, amount of dimensions yeah. <laughs> talking things that aren't simple and uh, have no point uh, we've reached our final installment which is Pop Pop Philosophy Quiz Pop 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 Pop, 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 pop. Philosophy Quiz yeah, you'll regret coming on the show after this, Liv, to put it bluntly. I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're playing Pop Pop Philosophy. Have you heard of this? But you don't you don't know the rules? No. Uh, yeah, so good. How do I explain so them? So you're gonna hear quotes. Two, oh, there you go, you're gonna right. hear quotes from what could potentially be a philosopher or could just potentially be just a random quote from someone, and you've got to guess uh what it is and me, you, and Greg will play, and we'll see who gets the most points. Really, okay. really simply, you can have quotes from three people. Then uh, we're playing Olivia Hukums, Olivia Coombs. So, <laughs> what? <laughs> Olivia Hukums, <laughs> Olivia Coombs. So you can have quotes from an Olivia, a quote from a Hukums, and an Olivia Coombs. Who's the Olivia? So Olivia Newton-John, the English-born Australian Mm. singer, songwriter, actress, dancer, entrepreneur and activist, best known for her roles as Hope in Score, a hockey musical, and Sandy in the 1978 hit Grease. Hums is the fictional private detective created by British author Sir Arthur Conan 
Doyle, Sherlock Holmes, and <laughs> Olivia Coombs, the philosopher and teacher at the University of Edinburgh, specialising in time travel and free will. So you've got Olivia Holmes mm. or Olivia Coombs. Got it. Uh, fastest finger first, just say Olivia Holmes or Olivia Coombs. The only weights I lift are my dogs. Holmes. Uh, that's not Holmes. Olivia. That's, that's Olivia. Well done, Ollie. <laughs> that's kind of funny because she did that song, Let's Get Physical. Did she? Yeah. Hot- Sing it. No. <laughs> <laughs> Hot take. All pedestrians should have to take a walking test. If they are deemed too slow, they have their legs removed. Olivia that's Coombs. Olivia Coombs. That's Olivia oh, Coombs. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> what you do oh, in this no. world is a matter of no consequence. The question is what you can make people Holmes. believe you have done. It's as hmm, no, well that Ollie Fass is there. Did you go to on to my Twitter? Is it it's weird terrible. going to the same place for lunch and dinner? Olivia, Olivia Coombs. Olivia Coombs. <laughs> Memories are inside me. <laughs> oh, no. Memories are inside me. Can we know they're can we know, not things where, where did you go for place? lunch and dinner? Oh, I can't remember some place in Edinburgh. Recommendation for God, that place. God, it's horrible. Talking of bad memories, quote, memories are inside me. They're not things or a place. Sherlock Holmes? That's not Sherlock Olivia. Holmes. That's Olivia. Okay, what are we on at the moment? We're on two, two for Ollie, one for Greg, one for Liv. That sounds about right, doesn't oh, me and, it? Me and Liv got one, Olivia one, Coombs twice. I'm a brain. The rest of me is mere appendix. Coombs. That's, hmm, sorry, Ollie was fastest there. A larger than usual amount of my hair is coming out. Is this normal? <laughs> or am I just going to go bald soon? That's Olivia Coombs. <laughs> that's Olivia Coombs. I was thinking it was not a serious. I'm hoping that's not a serious medical condition because I hesitated to put that one in. You're... <laughs> You're a fake and a phony, and I wish I'd never laid eyes on you. Olivia, that's Greece, isn't it? That's Greece. Oh, God. There is nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact. Hums. Hums. My name is Sherlock Hums. It is my (laughs) business to know what other people don't know. Olivia (laughs) Coombs. It's Hums. We're going to an award ceremony, and we're going to f***ing win. (laughs) (laughs) Olivia Olivia Newton-John. It's Olivia Coombs. Nice. Oh, we didn't win. Oh, I know it. it was really bad. It was fun. we we got nominated for our podcast, um, but oh god, it's horrible. Sorry again, I hesitate for that one because I was hoping that you won the award for the. No, Sorry we about didn't. That, Thanks for bringing that up, man. It's terrible memories. Just traumatizing our guests, Jack. <laughs> Thanks once again to Guns and Gabriels and Wesley and Downward, along with all of our patrons. In particular, thank you to the man who should have started. We've been so carried away and I think having a lot of fun and really enjoying the discussion that we jump right into the closing without our concluding remarks. So I thought it'd be nice here just to say a quick little uh, summary because I'd really want to reflect very quickly before we end the show on, on what has been a, a really, really enjoyable discussion. I think, Liv, you're not only uh, a brilliant writer and doing some really interesting ideas, but writing them clearly and, and suggesting some really interesting and, uh, I guess, attractive solutions to what are difficult problems. But not just that, like the work you're doing as part of your podcast and, and, the, and the way you are in speaking to you, like it, it might be one of the most enjoyable discussions we've had over the 77 episodes. I want to carry on and do, we could do like another five hours of this and, yeah. and I wouldn't want to want to stop discussing these ideas with you. Not only because the ideas are interesting, but because you present them so well in such an engaging way as well. So thank you from, from us and on behalf of our listeners for, for joining us today. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's been fun. Apart from the end part where you <laughs> delved into my tweet which was horrible yeah thanks for coming on the show Liv I've really enjoyed this episode one of the things I really like about philosophy is that it often surprises me so I'd never heard of any philosophy of time travel at all before I read your article Um, and I really enjoyed it and I just the idea that you know we can take a a topic like time travel which might initially be like wait what like how can there possibly be any philosophy of this it's it's impossible the idea that um, you know that People were talking about these ideas and uh, just and learning loads about it. I've really, really enjoyed. Um, and again, yeah, just to echo what Jack said, I really like the you know the idea of public facing philosophy. You know, engaging the public in ideas, uh, something that we do, something that you do. And I'm glad that you know uh, these ideas are out there because now when I discuss uh, the prison of Azkaban with my friends, I can be like, guys, it's just an eternal view of time, mm-hmm. and they'll think I'm really clever. So <laughs> yeah. thank you for that. No worries. Yeah, thank you for coming on the show, Liv. I really, I really enjoyed to begin with reading the paper uh, be- that you sent us beforehand, and I think, yeah, completely spot on. I kind of thought, who would, who on earth would ever think 
what abilities are depend on success conditions, right? What they are is the things you can do, the input conditions. Mm. That seems completely right to me. So I really enjoyed reading that. And I really, as well, like what reading your paper and talking to you today, again, it reminds me of what we, when we spoke to Stephen Mumford about what he said about that philosophy has a very low floor, but a very high ceiling, right? And this is stuck with me. Why? Because like mm. time travel is like it's this low floor, like everyone goes to the cinema, watches a time travel movie, and then yep. we all go, oh yeah, that's really cool. Da, da, da. So it's accessible. Everyone can get on board. But then what you get to do is you get to go, hold on, this is what time travel tells you about abilities. And that's rich metaphysical uh, kind of uh, theories there all about what abilities are. And as Liv talks about in her paper, what dispositions are. So you start at this really low floor, but you get so far and high with it to the ceiling. It's uh, That's what I really enjoyed about it. And the last thing I want to say is just... Apologies to my uh, granddad. (laughs) (laughs) And your mother. (laughs) Thank you once again to Cullum St. Gabriel's and West Hill Endowment, as well as all of our patrons for supporting the show. In particular, thank you to the man who should have started the butterfly effect, Mr. Dylan Kirby, the unbroken causal loop, causal loop, causal loop, Miss Lily Hooper, the man leading the future resistance against Skynet and on the run from Arnold Schwarzenegger, Mr. T, the man Jennifer Garner really wished she'd woken up as Mr. Jimmy Casper, son, the man with a life so storied, Ted Shang based his book on it. David Lejeunesse, I didn't write these ones. The man in a rabbit costume following round a troubled teenage boy. <laughs> Craig. <laughs> Mr. Van der Koek, never mind his daughter. He's the man Matthew McConaughey really went into Stella for. <laughs> Mr. Adam <laughs> And lastly, the man who puts the hog in Groundhog Day, Mr. Jim Clare. If you're a fan of the show, and today we've talked about everything, incest, murdering ourselves and our relatives and bread. If you're into all of that and you'd like to show us your support, well, now is the chance. You can head over to our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash panpsychast. A link is also in the iTunes description. And pledge a small monthly donation so we can keep producing the show. If you're not already donating, then don't worry, you'll be able to travel back to our episode one and start pledging from there. Links to Liv's work can be found on our website and in the description for this episode, along with links to the Two Philosophers, One Podcast, No Problems podcast. Thank you for listening to the wonderful soothing voices of Mr. Ollie Marty McFly Marley. Thank you for listening. Gregory the Dr. Miller. Thank you for listening. Miss Olivia the DeLorean Coombs. Cheers. Terrible movie, though. And me, Mr. Jack the Time Traveller's Wife, Symes. Thank you for listening. <laughs>